Another week has gone by, and in a sense, uh, I believe another opportunity of our spiritual growth has passed. In the midst of the practical pressures of the temporal life, we need to be aware of the importance of maintaining and growing in our spiritual enthusiasm and fervor. Every day that passes is an opportunity to grow strong in our faith, an opportunity for us to mature, an opportunity for us to be strengthened. As we have gone through a pretty long period of uh, difficulty and uh, for quite a number of people, the, some uh, difficult times of trial and suffering because of the pandemic, I began to realize the importance of uh, spiritual strength. Uh, and I have observed that those who have taken time to grow in the Lord, even before the pandemic, have been able to uh, be overcomers of this pandemic in a real way, where they have stayed focused upon God, they have stayed focused upon the faith, they have stayed the course of looking at the things that really matter. And in their focus upon God, in that uh, grounding that they have in the Lord, they have had what we would call a supernatural the strength that they have drawn from the Holy Spirit. And I have seen they have gone through this pandemic for some of them, spiritually stronger. And uh, even though we accept uh, the realities of the pandemic causing uh, practical pressures of daily life, they have been more than conquerors. Today, I would like to uh, set out uh, the uh, parameters or set out the uh, fundamentals of uh, what uh, spirituality in Christ is all about, so that there is a direction for each and every one of us to keep on pursuing this path into spiritual maturity and drawing from uh, that pursuit of spiritual maturity a supernatural strength given by the Holy Spirit to be able to be more than overcomers over the practical difficulties that have come from this pandemic. The text for the sermon today is taken from the first epistle of Peter written to believers living in five different provinces. You can see the uh, first verse of uh, the uh, first Peter and uh, he, Peter wrote it this way, to God's elect strangers in the world and scattered throughout these were the five provinces that were mentioned Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. Now Peter especially uh, addressed them as strangers in the world and uh, in the first Peter chapter 2 verse 11 he uh, addresses them as aliens and strangers in the world, it's because the Apostle Peter, through the, uh, this epistle written to all these uh, uh, believers in the five provinces, was trying to encourage them that in the midst of persecution and the sufferings and the trials that come along with it, there is strength to be drawn from maintaining our spiritual focus and our spiritual fervor and our spiritual enthusiasm, knowing what our priorities are. So I have taken uh, two verses from this first epistle written by Peter. It's drawn from chapter 2 and they are verses 4 and 5. Now, these uh, two verses are read this way. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Verse 4, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God, 
and precious to him. Verse 5, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices accept acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, if you look at these uh, two verses, uh, you will see uh, uh, Peter is focusing on Jesus. And he metaphorically, figuratively, he uses the description living stone for Jesus. As you come to him, he, told, uh, he is telling the believers, uh, as believers, when we come to Jesus, and then Jesus is described as the living stone with a capital S. The part where, Jesus, where Peter uses the word stone is actually to uh, describe uh, Jesus as the cornerstone of a building. And uh, in verse 5, Peter describes the church as a spiritual house. So in this case, you can uh, see that uh, Peter is looking into the church being built as a house or the church being built as a building. So what he has in mind is Jesus is the cornerstone of that building. Jesus is the cornerstone of the spiritual house. So the other part, when he describes uh, the stone as living, Peter is trying to emphasize that Jesus as the living stone, there is, uh, there is life through Jesus. He is the source of life. So he is a living stone. The church at times is described as an organism is because it, when, he's, when the writers write uh, and describe the church as a spiritual organism, they are looking into the fact that the church, in the church there is life. And uh, this life is a life that is drawn from Jesus. So the first question I would like to ask this morning is, what kind of life is in Jesus? and therefore in us as believers. We are living stones in verse 5 with a small letter S. We are living stones of the church and the church is described as a spiritual house. So all of us as believers, we form that spiritual house of the church. Each and every one of us is a part of the church as a living stone and we build that house from the foundation of the cornerstone of Jesus as the living stone. And it is appropriate to say that uh, even as we put our hands on the plow and uh, serve the Lord in the name of Christ, you will find that it is Jesus that is building that spiritual house through us. That is why if you uh, look back uh, in Matthew chapter 16, and uh, we have verse 18, where Jesus uh, mentions, and uh, when he spoke, he was uh, talking about uh, Peter being the rock, and uh, on the confession of faith of Peter, that Jesus will build the church. So from here, it becomes clear that the life that is drawn from Jesus, the life of believers, is a spiritual life. The church is a spiritual house. The life that is in the church, in us believers, is spiritual life. And Jesus is the source of that spiritual life. Then uh, verse 5 goes on to say that this uh, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. So here he's trying to uh, describe the spiritual house as 
a holy priesthood. Now, this description of a holy priesthood uh, has its background in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Israel, as the uh, people of God, uh, they had a, a priesthood. And uh, this institution of the priesthood was uh, an institution where the priests, they facilitated the worship of God through a sacrificial system. That means they oversaw the sacrificial system, they determined uh, how uh, worship of God should be done, and they are the ones that uh, work through the rules and regulations of sacrifice to God following the Levitical system. Now, that's in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you will find, especially over here, when the Peter mentions that the church is being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. It means that as far as the New Testament church is concerned, it does not have a, an institution of a priest anymore. But on the other hand, all of us as believers, we are able to approach God and worship Him directly through the one and only mediator, Jesus Christ. Which means all of us can approach God directly. We do not need an institution of priests anymore. And we can actually put it this way, that the church is now the priesthood itself. So, when we talk about priesthood, then uh, we will definitely uh, be drawn to think of sacrifices. So that is why Peter goes on to say that uh, the spiritual house is to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So this comes to the next uh, part uh, that uh, we are to offer sacrifices to God as a holy priesthood and these sacrifices are spiritual sacrifices. So what are spiritual sacrifices? We can see that uh, spiritual sacrifices, they, they are described uh, elsewhere in the New Testament in a few places. Hebrews 13 verse 15, the uh, Hebrew writer writes, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Which means the church, as a priesthood of believers, one primary task of the church is to offer the spiritual sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. This represents or this means that we are to confess the name of God, we are to praise God for who he is, we are to give glory and honor to God, and this is what we term as worship. So the first task of the church, the first task that we ground the church on is the task of worship. And I would call this the exaltation of God. Then we come to Romans 12 verse 1, where the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Here, when Paul uses uh, the phrase offering our bodies as living sacrifices, he is using the word bodies as the life that we have now. That means our whole life 
is a living sacrifice to be offered to God. And the Apostle Paul describes that that life that we are offering to God is a life that needs to be a holy life and it needs to be pleasing to God. It's a life of holiness, righteousness and godliness. And this is what I would term uh, the second task of the church is growing in holiness and godliness. And I would call this the edification of the believer. Then there is Romans 15 verse 16. In this one verse, Paul describes himself and he describes himself this way that he is called to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. And what was his role? What was his calling? With the priestly duty. That means it's the duty of the priest that is being uh, uh, described uh, as us, as believers who are a holy priesthood. The priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And this word, an offering to God, is spiritual sacrifice. So, in the Romans 15 verse 16, the third task of the church is the sharing of the gospel. And this sharing of the gospel is what I would call evangelism to the lost. So when we actually uh, take a, a step back and try to look into uh, what has been uh, developed, you will find that these three key words the exaltation of God, exaltation, the edification of the believer, edification, and evangelism to the lost. Evangelism defines the mission of the church as a spiritual house built to be a holy priesthood. All of us as believers are part and parcel of the mission of, this, of the church and the tabernacle of praise. Our mission will revolve around these three tasks. The exaltation of God, referring to worship. The edification of the believer, referring to our lives manifesting holiness and righteousness and godliness. And the third one, the evangelism to the lost, that we are to reach the world with the gospel. And this is how the spiritual house of tabernacle of praise will be built to be a holy priesthood. I come to uh, this particular question. If uh, we uh, go along this direction of uh, uh, setting our priorities right, and then understanding the church as a spiritual house, then uh, we will then be able to walk along the path of spiritual growth, which will strengthen us. And that strengthening grace of uh, God is what is much needed during difficult times like this. But there is a stumbling block. And I have noticed that this one stumbling block, the stumbling block to our spiritual growth, what exactly is the primary stumbling block to our spiritual growth? And uh, I would put it this way, that this uh, stumbling block to our spiritual growth has to do with uh, the priorities of our life. And I want to begin with uh, looking into uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, where the Apostle Paul wrote, Ephesians 1, verse 3, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And the, the stumbling block of, to our spiritual growth has something to do with the word blessings. We know we are blessed when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and our Saviour. But what exactly is the nature of the blessings? And in Ephesians 1 verse 3, the Apostle Paul specifically states that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And he is trying to differentiate between spiritual blessing and temporal blessing. Now, what was on the Apostle Paul's mind when he wrote this phrase, spiritual blessing in Christ, to, uh, to really uh, understand more about what these spiritual blessings are, it would be good if you read uh, the first 17 uh, verses of Ephesians chapter 1. And this comes out, the spiritual blessings of adoption, that we are adopted to be sons and daughters of God, that God becomes our Father, the spiritual blessing of redemption, that we are redeemed from um, being in the kingdom of the world, being in darkness, to the kingdom of God, uh, into a kingdom of light. We are redeemed from uh, the power of sin, so that in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we are now able to walk in holiness. And we are redeemed from the penalty of sin, which means uh, judgment is removed away from us and our eternal destiny is secure in Christ, that one day we will go back to glory in heaven with God. So these spiritual blessings as outlined in Ephesians chapter 1 is the focus of the Apostle Paul. Then the Apostle Paul encourages uh, the Ephesian church, the believers, to realize and be aware of the uh, magnitude of what God has done in Christ, to be able to appreciate uh, adoption, redemption, forgiveness of sins, and uh, also that uh, that gift of God to us, that in Christ we have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And uh, all this should give us an overwhelming sense of thanksgiving and gratitude to God, that these spiritual blessings, they far outweigh the temporal blessings. So, what do I mean by temporal blessings? The temporal blessings, they refer to probably, uh, you know, uh, success uh, that we can achieve in this life. They refer to uh, the uh, finances that God blesses us with, our growth in wealth, and they can also refer to our physical health. Those would be the temporal blessings and in a certain way, good relationships uh, between the spouses, good relationships that we have uh, with other people, those would be classified as temporal blessings. And we thank God, I want to say it very clearly, we thank God for these temporal blessings and God does bless us temporally that the blessings that we obtained as children of God, the blessings as a people of God, the blessings that we have as a holy priesthood, they cover both the spiritual blessings and the temporal blessings. But at the same time, I would like to draw attention to the very fact that the spiritual blessings are the primary blessings that the spiritual blessings far outweigh 
the temporal blessings because the spiritual blessings carry eternal significance and consequences while the temporal blessings are only for this short period of this life. That is why if you work back uh, to uh, 1 Peter, which is, which is uh, the uh, epistle from which we drew our text, that Peter wants to emphasize this very fact that we as a holy uh, priesthood of believers that the church has a spiritual house, we are aliens and strangers in this world. And it's because of the very fact that Peter wants to draw us to set our priorities right, to focus on the spiritual blessings rather than the temporal ones. And I want to repeat this. We thank God for the temporal blessings, but we must shift our focus on the person of God and on the spiritual blessings primarily. So I would like to answer the question I mentioned. What is the primary stumbling block to our spiritual growth? The primary stumbling block to our spiritual growth is when the temporal blessings become our idols and the center of our lives. And uh, does it happen? I would say, as uh, I relate with believers, I find uh, often this is the case, <laughs> that uh, sometimes unknowingly for believers, the temporal blessings of health, of wealth, of success, and the temporal blessings of relationships, they become the center of a believer's life. And you will find that the, 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 the believer experiences a, a great measure of spiritual ups and downs is because his uh, spiritual um, fervor and his spiritual vitality and understanding uh, and enthusiasm is a reference to how much money he has, reference to how healthy he is, reference to the success he has achieved and also reference to his relationships and uh, then temporal blessings become a stumbling block to our spiritual growth and uh, as we reach this point uh, in today's sermon i would want to say that in understanding the mission of the church as expressed in exaltation, edification, and evangelism, and appreciating the full significance of the church as a spiritual house, believers leading spiritual lives, and offering spiritual sacrifices, and enjoying spiritual blessings, the first step to take in maintaining and growing in spiritual fervor and spiritual enthusiasm is this one act. Everything uh, begins from there. It is the act of consecration. I would like to ask, and uh, this is a vital question. Ask yourself this morning, when was the last time you deliberately, consciously, and uh, with a heart's real desire, come to the Lord to say, I consecrate my life to you. This act of consecration, laying our life at the cross of Calvary and then uh, asking our Lord to sanctify our life, laying it down holy for God, living for Him, laying down our life, consecrating it as an offering and a spiritual sacrifice to God. 
That is where Romans 12 1 comes in so strongly. And I read it once again. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is a spiritual act of worship. In this one verse, Romans 12, 1, Paul puts everything together, worship, holiness, and in holiness is tied in the purpose of God to indeed uh, grow us to be used as vessels to share the gospel. So today I encourage all of us to set some time aside, go into your quiet room, consecrate your life to God in all its aspects. Lay your heart down to God in your thoughts, in your emotions, in your morality and in your will. In your thoughts as the Spirit of God to illumine your mind so that you will indeed have a mind that is close to what we would call the likeness of the mind of Christ that you will think of things that are godly, things that are holy, you will think of things that are edifying, you will think of things that are good, that are pleasing to God. And when your thoughts are consecrated to God, then you will find that it will follow with consecrated emotions, that you will not experience anxiety, you will not experience uh, worry you will not experience uh, the uh, the temptation to be unforgiving you will not experience uh, the temptation for bitterness for unrighteous emotions but you will in the empowerment of the holy spirit grow in love joy and peace and experience the righteous emotions that god indeed wants to bless you with. And then you will find that in that consecration of your heart, your morality will be firmed up, firmed up in reference to the word of God. That your value system will concur with the value system of the word of God. That you will not involve yourself in more immorality. You will understand that uh, in the Ten Commandments, as a outline and a moral uh, reference for our lives that you will indeed uh, not indulge in anger and grow in bitterness that you will not indulge in adultery you will stay faithful to your marriage covenant you will not uh, become a liar you will not steal and you will not covet what belongs to others and the Ten Commandments become a, a reference for you to reference your morality. And then, finally, your consecration of your will. And in that consecration of your will, you will choose the righteous path. So from your thoughts, to your emotions, to your morality, and to your will, these are components of your heart which when you consecrate to God, you will grow unto spiritual maturity. And this act of consecration uh, begins with laying your life at the cross of Calvary for, and you focusing upon Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, offering your lives as living sacrifices to God. Consecration is the beginning of this process of spiritual transformation of the heart. And uh, consecration will follow through. God will give you a fresh desire to study His Word. It will follow through with uh, the study of the Word and uh, 
reflection on the word in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, a fresh uh, prayer focus and uh, vibrant worship of the Lord personally in your communion with God, you will then encounter God in a fresh new way and spiritual transformation will take place. Now, such a subjective experience of the presence of God, they need to be nurtured and cultivated. And uh, it has to be done continually, it has to be done uh, diligently. And uh, here is where I would say your act of consecration, a primary, uh, a primary activity that is related to it is what I would describe as contemplative spiritual reflection. So, if we do all this, then it is, I believe, the prayer of all of us that we will all be able to grow strong in our faith to maintain our spiritual fervor and uh, spiritual vitality, dynamism and enthusiasm in the Lord. And through such difficult times that we are going through, that in that act of consecration, I believe we will all be able to draw a fresh new strengthening grace of God to be mighty in the Lord. And as we set our focus on the mission of the church in exaltation of, the, of God, in worship, in edification of the believer, in growing in holiness, in evangelism to the lost, in sharing the gospel, and we set the priority of our spiritual life, the pursuit of it right in the center of our faith and living out this spiritual life through spiritual sacrifices to God and making spiritual blessings as our primary understanding of blessings in Christ then tabernacle of praise will indeed surely be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood with Jesus Christ as the living stone with a capital S and all of us as living stones with a small s. And uh, I end with Romans chapter 12 verses 11 and 12. Romans chapter 12 verses 11 and 12 was written by uh, the Apostle Paul uh, to believers in the church at Rome centuries ago. And it gives us encouragement to persevere. And the Apostle uh, Paul puts it this way, Never be lacking in zeal, but to keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Let us bow our heads as we commit this time and the whole sermon that has been shared to the Lord. Father, we thank you for the grace that we have found in our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And today, we pray that the Spirit of God will enlighten our spirits so that we become aware that the church is a spiritual house built to be a holy priesthood. And we are living stones that are grounded in the living stone of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. 
And we pray, O oh Father, that we will grow in internalizing and understanding the mission of the church of which we are a part, the worship of you in exaltation, growing in holiness, in edification, and sharing the gospel to the lost in evangelism. And we know that as a holy priesthood, we are to offer to you spiritual sacrifices and to receive in turn primarily the spiritual blessings that you have predestined for us in Christ even before the foundation of the world. And I pray that all of us will grow strong in the Lord, maintaining our spiritual fervor and receive a special strengthening grace from you, O oh Father, to go through these difficult times of the pandemic. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I bless each and every one with the strengthening grace of God upon their lives, even as they see that the church is a spiritual house and each and every one of them is a part of this holy priesthood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.